Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to I Can't Shut Up Unless You Tell Me To. Now, uh, for those watching on YouTube, here is some generic Elden Ring footage that I have. Uh, you can see uh, video Evan lurking down in the background. He'll be badly playing Elden Ring during this, but for those listening to the audio version, don't worry about it. Okay, so let's talk Elden Ring. Shadow of the Earth Tree. Like, this is going to be a, you know, I'm going, don't, this is obviously, there's going to be spoilers and stuff present, given the footage you might see on screen on YouTube, but for those other ones who are in the naivete, or those listening in audio, yeah, so I have to be talking about certain details as it pertains to the Shadow of the Earth Tree, and, um, this will be a spoilery kind of review. It's not going to spoil everything, but you know, I'm not going to be hiding, you know, in, in, in obscure, obfuscating things as much here. So, obviously, let's start with how I played, beat, and completed the game. I, uh, I'm on Journey 43. I have a level 604 character. So, obviously, the time spent here in, uh, the, in the, in the, uh, Shadowlands is, uh, a little bit different from people who might be doing it on their, for, on their Journey 1 playthrough, or even their new first New Game Plus. God, New Game Plus 1, man, that, that is an experience, it, it makes things so much easier, it's insane, but I digress. Um, obviously you have to beat Moog and Radon. Why do you have to beat Moog? Well, Vantrance is in his council room. How do you beat Radon? Uh, well, Radon is important to the story. Um, I see the fucking solos. Um, the first thing I kind of want to address with this is the difficulty allegations. Yes, Shadow of the Earth Tree is hard. Um, but no, the people whining and bitching about the difficulty in it are are not necessarily people that, you know, Miyazaki said, hey, if you're going to play this game, like, you're going to have to do get this, uh, the, skid the Skiddy Tree uh, fragments, the Shadow Tree fragments that you we find, that you find that upgrade your, both your damage resistance and damage output, and then there was just a bunch of people that said, oh, it's going to make the game too easy, I'm not going to do that, and then these people will then write a negative you have Shadow Deer Tree is bitching about the difficulty of it, even though they're not really engaging in the exploration aspect of Shadow Deer Tree. The whole purpose of Elden Ring, and I maintain this, is replacing the tenacity and perseverance of the Dark Souls games and previous FromSoft titles with uh, exploration. You don't need to beat your head against a boss for 15, for, for 15 hours trying to beat it like you had to in Dark Souls 1. Two, three, and Bloodborne, or Sekiro, you can just fuck off and go somewhere else, and find some, and like get some levels, get some, find another boss, talk by your time, beat that boss, get rich from that, find a new spell, find a new weapon, find a new armor, and then come back and trunce the boss once you've gotten a few levels and some toys. Like this is how you're supposed to play Elden Ring, and a lot of people refuse to do that because stubbornness and, and and they say I want to play it the way I want to play which is completely valid but then these are the same types of folks that will subsequently shit on people for using spirit summons and tell you that's not how you're supposed to play the game blah 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 I digress to address ult penultimately the scaling of damage in Shadow of the Earth Tree the so long as you are exploring and collecting your skibbity tree fragments or whatever the fuck they're called you're going to have a perfectly fine time. Also, make sure you pick up your revered spirit ashes. Yes, you may not want to use uh, summons during your playthrough. They also make it so, t so Torrent can take more than a hit ever. So, also, that's important to keep in mind. The scaling in the game from start to finish is solid. Uh, the game is relatively well balanced, you know, uh... Obviously, once you hit, you know, Skibbity Tree level 120, which is the max level, uh, everything kind of, like, becomes optimal. Early bosses, like the Divine Beast, uh, Renella, 
um, and everything basically you played before Mesmer, uh, is in a better spot, honestly. Um, you know, you like, it, you know, you obviously, like, you're going to be, you're not going to be beating them as easily as, like, on, new, like, your new game plus fighting Godric or Market. You're not going to be clipping into them for that, like, with that much damage, like, in that same way. But what can happen with it is uh, more so a fact of, you know, you're probably, you know, curb stomping them to the level that you would curb stomp market. You know, it's, you're, it's solid health bar, you know, but you're, you know, dodging properly and you're dealing more damage than you would have otherwise at, like, at skibbity, skibbity toilet tree level five at like at, at, at 15 tw at 20 you're doing more damage than you were at like the five or six levels you had then especially with the with the balance patch which i would argue is probably called for on the side of 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 from soft making it so that the early levels you gain are more beneficial than the later levels but the but the night the the upgrading from 19 to 20 is the problem is the largest bonus you get which is Probably the way it should have been, like a much, like a like a much more hump. Like I think that is probably going to be helpful for people, but by and large, the balancing across all of the bosses is really solid. Um, but I, I will say that, like as far as like the bosses and stuff are concerned, and the boss fights themselves, um, the only time I didn't really have to change anything about my build per se, and until I got to the last boss, which. I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, that was frustrating. I, I I do think that you know, in true FromSoft tradition, the you know entire DLC being like more difficult than the base game, obviously, and then the last boss just being a ball busting pain in the ass is you know, in, in, in line. Um, I will say that there are some poorly designed aspects of to do it, and I'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, for the time being, though, I want to talk about uh, the different zones in. Uh, general, uh, you start on the gravesite plains, which is the uh, you know all the promotion materials you see of like of of of, of Mikola on Torrent, uh, in, in you know with the with the with the, uh, with the skidoo tree, which is uh, uh, the scud tree, uh, which is the proper more proper representation of the big old tree in the thin center, and um, what ends up happening is um, uh, you know go into these plains, a bunch of ghost graves around. A uh, large open area of some things to see, uh, things tucked in behind cliffs. Um, I think the first boss I fought in the game was the uh, a Black Jail Knight. Uh, pretty interesting boss fight, has a Slave Knight Gale, um, you know, uh, crossbow, so it has that fun attack, Jesus Christ, in a confined space, so that, but I beat that and that was perfectly all well and good. Um, there's one uh, furnace golem. Furnace golems being the giant, like you know, wicker men burning thing that you could see in certain places, in, like in the, some of the promotional materials. There, like it's it's not an intuitive fight. It's not an, a super intuitive um, experience. In that, um, I think that you kind of just have to kind of figure out what to do. Um, just a pro tip for anybody who hasn't been able to figure it out or just wants some help with that. Don't bother damaging them if they have unarmored legs, which all except two have. Um, just whack them in their feet. Every time they lift their feet up to their one foot up to do the AOE, just jump to avoid it. Jumping is more reliable than dodging it. Um, whenever they, whenever the entire thing jumps up into the air, run away, and then and then after it hit comes down, like after it hits the ground. Wait a half second, then jump to dodge the AOE. Make sure you run far enough away to get away from the explosion, and then immediately run back. If you get too far away from the furnace golems, they'll start doing their AOE, their 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 uh, range of attacks, which will kill you. It's better to just hug them and kill them. If they are armored, usually if they have armored legs, there is usually a spirit well you can find. Jump up with torrent, and um, then just uh, attack from above. You'd be better off. You I, you would be recommended to use hefty furnace pot, uh, hefty fire pots. They for some reason do obscene amounts of damage when you throw them directly into the 
a wicker man's like head. So, the more you know. Um, otherwise, uh, I will say, uh, you know, maybe NPCs, uh, the NPCs and storylines in this game are going to be super critical to your enjoyment and your experience, and also the different outcomes. There's a boss fight just before the final boss where, depending on how many quest lines you've done, routes you've taken in said quest lines, um, it, 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 it w that will ultimately determine whether or not uh, you ha like how many people you fight in a boss fight, which is a gang fight, by the way. Spoilers. Like if you don't do certain, if you there, you can have a couple NPCs come with you and fight on your side by completing their quest lines. You can have some NPCs, NPCs not appear on the opponent's side by giving by give, talking, giving the certain. Um, dialogue options when talking to them and you can and you can also spirit summon during this. So you can at bet at worst you're going to have a five V of one, two, three, four a uh, four slash five V one or two if you use a spirit summon. And at best it'll be a three V three or or a four a three V four, you know, because you don't do diligence. I digress. Um, the voice acting and the story telling in these NPC quests is quite lovely, and I think it's great. They also added a couple new different things as well. A couple new weapons. They have the, these uh, some type of weapons called Smith Script, which uh, these are weapons that can create new weapons that fade away out of nowhere. Uh, also added the ability of like usable throwing knives. These are called the Smith Script Daggers. Uh, what will happen is that when you throw them, a new one will appear in your hand immediately, and you know it does. You attack using um, uh, knife attacks. It also throws them out, so you have a ranged dagger, which is very, very nice. These Smith script daggers can also be used wet blades to turn them into status effects generators. Although I will say the best status effect generators that they've added were probably the new perfume weapons, the perfumer bottle weapons. So instead of perfumes solely being uh, uh, consumable items, which they still are, you now have one, two, three, four, I believe four uh, perfumer weapons now that, uh, that do different types of damage. You have the poison one that does physical, frost one does magic, uh, and then you have the frenzied flame perfume bottle and the fire perfume bottle that flame damage and all of them uh, come with all of those data specs the perfume bottle the perfume bottles of poison frost and frenzy flame all inflict poison frost and badness respectively uh, this means that the perfumer's talisman is now a viable option something to consider uh, plenty of, uh, they have now added, uh, backhanded blades, uh, these are, you, know, you have your normal back, your typical backhanded blade, which is just a weeaboo weapon, and then you have, like, your, uh, curved blades with the circular blades, which function as, like, dancing blades. They're interesting enough, I'm not a fan, personally, I think the backhanded blade was useful, but once I got access to the vaults, which was a, which, you know, is a, a curved sword that can be power stance to have two weapons on at once. I was kind of with bleed. Uh, it was kind of rough. I will say bleed by and large has been like the, the champion. Bleed, bleed and to a lesser extent frost has kind of been the W uh, uh, winner uh, in my time as Shadow Fear Tree. Um, especially with when I was at lower lower Skidoo Tree. And if we're talking about status effects and uh, yeah, things of that nature. One of the things I also want to reiterate is the fact that um, holy damage is actually really fucking viable. Even di uh, enemies uh, you would think would be uh, strong against holy damage aren't. Even the final boss, which just does bonkers holy damage to you, is not resistant to it. I think the FromSoft team kind of realized that, hey, uh, Holy damage is basically fucking useless in the latter half of, in basically the second half of the fucking game. So we're going to make the holy damage usable. And usable they did. They added a few new incantations that were, that I think are very, very fun. Um, 
uh, I think the big one I like is the uh, uh, Holy Ark. Big Holy Ark. It's just a giant cone. It's just a giant uh, arc of, of holy damage that is that doesn't uh, that is able to you know touch walls and not immediately break. It's quite nice. They also added a new spin to win uh, discus that instead of coming back to you after you throw it will uh, stay where will, will stay where it hit and can deal continuous damage. This is a very very good option as far as holy damage is concerned to deal you know constant chip damage to bigger enemies because it sticks around for quite a while and you can throw it unbelievably far. Um, the next thing I want to know is just continuing going with the gravesite planes. Final the bot you you go in, you go left go into the Bellary Tower settlement a very interesting place to kind of see the the, the, the sins of the greater will or the golden order to, among the people here. Um, I don't really want to talk about too much about the lore in this episode, if I'm being perfectly honest. Uh, I do want to talk about uh, moving on to the next area, the Cerulean Coast. One of the most gorgeously designed from soft locations in any of their games. It is a just a sea of blue deep blue and light blue flowers. It is gorgeous. Um, there isn't a whole ton here. There's a couple like spinter stuff, but it, if I'm being perfectly honest, uh, the above ground, you know, area is to me personally, um, I think so much more could have been done in this area because it is gorgeous. And outside of like a mausoleum, couple bosses, some hidden things, and, you know, the going second point to do one of the NPC Stoliere's quest to talk to St. Trina. <sighs> More could have been done here with the, with the space, and I'm bummed that it wasn't, but, you know, beggars can't necessarily be choosers, unfortunately. Um, ultimately, from from here, uh, once we're done in this ruling coast, uh, you go through ca uh, a castle, you fight uh, Ranella, which is, who is apparently, fun fact, Ranella's uh, little sister, who, and, you know, uses something called the Two Moons Sorcery, which will use, which will be, is basically a three, uh, three explosive shockwaves that hit, like, fuck all when you use it, but will hurt, will murk your ass if you use it IRM. Uh, if you get used it against you from the boss. Um, very interesting boss fight. Um, magic and fire kind of represented in two. She dropped her remembrance weapon as a two-handed sword that I think is very, very interesting. Or is a is it is it are two or is is are is a weapon that are just two swords that you can power because it's very interesting and I think somewhere, up, and it goes well with an amulet of hers, for the Renella amulet, which the longer you uh, hold a stance before it, using an attack, kind, it's kind of busted. Um, moving on, uh, from uh, once you get past this point, or you or you wow. find like the What's way around the boss room there, you get to the Skadoo, uh, sc uh, Scud Atlas, the Scud Tree. I think it's called Scud Tree. Um, the Scud Atlas. Uh, Altus, Scud Altus, my bad, which is the parallel to the Altus Plateau. Um, from here, you have a few different options. You can head northwest and head to the uh, uh, Cathedral of Mitis Miter, which is this is where you're going to find most of your sorceries in the DLC. Uh, this DLC was very generous with incantation. Sorceries kind of like didn't get as much. And most of the sources you're going to find are through this the quest line here, as well as, most interestingly, after it's resolving, a, a, a remembrance that gives you access to a glintstone staff that can also be used to cast incantations that scales off both strength, intelligence, and faith. Very interesting. And honestly, like as much as I love having the you know, arc staff that has cane scaling and things of that nature, so, you know, just get that extra boost of on like blood loss of frost. Personally, I think it's I, I think I I think it's like a more reliable to like have access to both toolboxes because I, this is the first time I've started using sorceries at all and it's been wonderful to, to use both personally. Moving on, um, you you from from the Scud at uh, from Scud Altus you can also head uh, south. You can 
getting access to Caro's grave. Caro's grave is a kind of a parallel to the cerulean coast with a beautiful red. Now this red and blue and deep and, and deep and deep and, and you know, deep blues. This is all reds and grays. This is a it feels wrong here in certain parts. Uh, uh, sad even. Um, there isn't a whole whole ton here. You can find a couple uh, you know, delves that you get some pretty cool loot from. Uh, you can find a furnace golem here that you have to throw in hefty fire pots from above, and this will ultimately give you access to um, you know, the, the, the tier. By the way, the furnace golems, they hold the new Wondrous Physics tiers. In fact, if you are a Sekiro fan, if you beat the Iron the Golem out front um, at the Three Cross Site of Grace in um, the Gravesite Plains, he drops a uh, t crimson tier that effectively kind of lets you be able to play a version of Sekiro uh, in Elden Ring. So the more you know. Moving on, um, the next place that you have to you can only get through this by going through a. Uh, it is one of those places that you can only get to by going through a. Um, a lot of the uh, there's a lot of regions that are only accessible by going through uh, catacombs or caves, and if you don't go through those specific catacombs or caves, you don't access these regions. Uh, one of these is the Jagged Peak, which is has one of the best examples of voice acting and character acting this year, um, and that is with Egon, uh, the Drake Hunter. He is it is um, the it is. I think that they, they could, if 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 they cut this entire thing from the DLC and then put out like a ten dollar twenty dollar DLC called uh, uh, the Dragon Peaks uh, Dragon Peaks Ascent or whatever, put uh, and then you know you basically made it so you're like like the whole gig is like ascending this this uh, uh, this mountain for the purposes of slaying this evil dragon at the top that all that these NPCs you this run into just broke vile to, to with every fiber of their being. I will, I'll personally, I will say that I think that it, it would, I would have bought it. I would have think it'd been great. Like, like this is a, feels like it was like this, this quest line and quest that you do is completely detached from the rest of the game. Like the rest of the game, and that's the same that can be said with the cathedral, where you get all the sorceries from. Like the they are they are quest lines that are detached entirely from the ongoings of Mikola and all of that shit, which you know is it's a fun little romp to do, and, and I think it's quite enjoyable. Um, the Center Dragon Peak is is really really awesome. It is a it, it feels like a hero's quest type of thing, hero's journey type of thing, all encompassed within. Shadow of Tree, and I cannot recommend it enough. It's quite lovely. Um, I, I think in the next place you could probably go to from there is uh, I think I think that's all I think that's all you basically kind of ask. You can go to the base um, uh, base room, which is Rahu, which is like Rahu is like a, this giant like like ruins to the northeast that you get access to. Through the Shadow Keep, which is Mesmer's Fortress, the the trend of the DLC, um, and you know there's there's we, there's the top half and the bottom half, and both can be act, are accessed in different ways. Um, but you know there's some cool stuff down there. I'm not there's nothing really so important aside from maybe like fighting one of the big bears and getting the bear incantations and stuff. There's not really much otherwise. I think I can contribute there that you know, sounds necessarily interesting. Um, Mesmer is the first, like, I think the first, like, truly difficult, like, like balls to the walls, oh, get fucked, that fight. Renella thought you, I thought Renella felt like that, but it's not necessarily the case. Mesmer, uh, a good equivalent for Mesmer, I would give is Melania. If you were able to beat Melania and you were able to be comfortable with Melania's, like, like, tells and knowing, like, how to dodge and things of that nature, um, you will be able to do Mesmer, no problem. Um, it just takes practice learning his move sets and things of that nature, and that can be frustrating. But otherwise, I think it's quite good. Uh, his that's for his first phase. His second phase, a little bit of bullshit, a little bit bullshit. I recommend not lock, unlock, like de-locking on for certain attacks. 
but otherwise I think it's completely doable without summons of that nature. Just a reminder, when you are doing summons and stuff within the game, um, there are going to be cases of you know, certain quest lines will have certain outcomes if you do or do not summon them during boss fights. Remember that, it's your own prerogative. The other thing I want to remind everybody that all of the bosses in this game, their AI has from has been optimized to expect multiple combatants. So, you know, if you genuinely don't want a spirit summon doing real damage like Mimic Tier, Black Knight Tish, or any or Ovin or Nefeli Lu, go pick up the uh, little shield boys, like the great shield wraiths or whatever, and use them just to, you know, occasionally pull aggro so you can heal the buff. These bosses are, uh, they will fight your ass. They will fight your ass, and they will be on your ass like white on the face. It's rough. Um, as far as Messimer is concerned, he's a good boss fight. He's perfectly fine. Um, uh, he's kind of like, an, I would say he's pretty much like on par with uh, Melania. Um, other than that, I don't, uh, you know, I, he's, he's, it's an excellently very well built boss fight. Cool lore, cool dialogue, cool cutscenes, no notes. I loved it. It's great. Uh, in fact, Let Me Solo Her has rebranded him, rebranded to Let Me Solo Him, and has focused on uh, the boss fight. There is um, on on Mess Murray. It's like I'm not touching that final boss. Fuck that. And I'm like I completely understand. Um, moving from there, you move on to uh, Queen, of, like a, a, a mother of the bud or whatever. Just a Scarlet Ross Scorpion boss is whatever. Not that hard, not that bad. Uh, it's, if you if you've got like high enough immunity to like handle Scarlet Rod, it's generally not that big of a deal. Fight uh, generally good telegraphs. Uh, the process of getting to that boss fight is a bit of a nightmare. If I'm being perfectly honest, um, I hate I hated every second of it. The, that region is notoriously bad. Um, in uh, uh, terms of like to, like trying to find a way around, it's a giant maze. Lots of falling off of ledges, lots of enemies. It's, it can be kind of rough, if I'm being perfectly honest. But it is it is a gorgeous area, so I'm willing to forgive all of that frustration for how fucking pretty it is. Um, from there, you get on to uh, Ilium Inir, I think is I think how you pronounce it. It's probably not how you pronounce it, but that's how I'm going to pronounce it. Um, Ilium Inir. Ilium Inir. Ilir, how what the fuck is that spell? Hold on, Enir Ilum. Ugh. It's spelled E N I R hyphen L L I N. Enir Ilum. It uh, it's um, a legacy dungeon. Pretty cool legacy dungeon. That's kind of like the second half of the Bellarue Tower element. But um, you can kind of, but just there's an and there's an elevator connected to it. It's pretty cool. Um. I will, I will say that uh, fighting through this dungeon is takes a lot, uh, but once you know the path, you can kind of run through most of it without issue. There are some pretty powerful warriors and stuff in it that will be worried. Um, eventually you get to uh, the room, which is um, where you have to fight all of the NPCs that you have had you know, made friends and stuff with up until this point. Um, so, bear, be, bear in mind, be, be, be careful that uh, you will end up having a rough time with, of, of it um, if you don't do spirit summons. Because, like, imagine, like, a 5v1, like a 4 or 5v1 PvP match. That's what the fuck you're dealing with. So, summons are justifiable in that, even if you're one of those no summons peoples. Um... And the really awesome thing about this boss fight is, is that as the boss fight rages on, like NPCs are like having conversations and in dialogue with each other, and what depending on the number of quests you've done and how much you finished, you know, you'll have lots of you know, depending on the like what quests that you've finished, what things you've done, all of that stuff. Um, the dialogue will be different, and they'll be able to be respectful. It's all it's a very somber. It's like it's like a bittersweet. Uh, type of fight type of thing like uh, Needle Knight Lead is the only one that wants hands same thing with Riley Dane but um you know talking more more and Foliar talking uh, Red uh, uh, Red Maid Knight the Red Maid Knight and, and Onspock talking Onspock and Letta 
Like, it's all very sad and kind of melancholy. And I do wish that I, there was a way to, like, story-wise side with um, Mikola more so and make him, you know, kind of, like, letting that, making the, letting the that go through. But you can't, unfortunately, which is... I don't know. It's sad and then and, and upsetting like that. Like I, I, I'm interested in seeing what they would do story wise. But you know, you get through that. Um, you know, with all the NPCs and all that beautifully written dialogue and stuff. You and you get to the final boss room, and it's Prime Radon, and it's Prime Radon. And here's kind of where I, my praise of the DLC, is kind of going to go down the toilet. This is the. Uh, one boss in the game that I think kind of, like, invalidates a lot, like, the stuff I've said in the past. I don't have to change my build that much for most bosses in Elden Ring, you know. I tend to run a very fire-heavy build, uh, and fire-heavy builds for things like Fire Giant may not like, be kosher, whatever. The problem is, is that ultimately I do have to might maybe change weapon, couple weapons. You know, I don't really have to like change the, my actual strategy that much. With Radon, pro, and with with Promise Consort Radon in both in both phases, I am stacking heavy. Or I'm ha stacking heavy armor, fingerprint shield, and the in a great lance that does bleed. And I and I just block poke, block poke, block poke, block. Yes, I know it's campy. No, I don't want to do it. The problem is, is, is that while the first phase of Radon is difficult, very difficult, much, yes, but, you know, has very tight but clear things that you can do to dodge attacks and strategies done therein. The problem mostly comes in with phase two, because he has the, all of those movesets that he has in phase one and also, every single attack he does has an explosion of light of light beams come up underneath you. So there really is, even if you are dodging into him completely, you're still getting hit with damage. At the very least, some chip damage. It is not enjoyable to deal with. And if you try to dodge the light, you get hit by his main attack, which does so much more damage. You're eventually just like... The, he, here's the thing. His base form doesn't really give you time to necessarily heal either. Like, there, there are definitive times you can heal, but you have to choose, do I hit him, or do I heal? And a lot of times, like, a, you know, in the first in the first round, like, oh yeah, you can dodge it flawlessly and then hit him. Don't, no need to heal, everything's fine. The problem is that once you get to phase two, you know, do you heal or do you hit, and you eventually you're just going to end up always hitting or always healing. Not necessarily, like, it's, I'm being hyperbolic. It's not that bad to that degree. I mean, it, but it is close. The other thing that you kind of also have to deal with is, is, is that uh, he'll have these dash attacks where he will hit you repeatedly in fast succession with attacks, and if you, unless you, like, block or, you know, are able to sort of, like, dodge around it and in, 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 at such an angle that you only take, like, one hit from it, then you can do it, but it, it, it is, I haven't seen anybody necessarily been able to accomplish that just yet, and the best way I've seen to dealing with it with that particular attack is by blocking, find a great shield. Um, the other thing that I think, I, and the last thing I think that is like very, very frustrating to deal with is he has like the meat fly to the sky meteor attack that he has from the base game. The difference is in the base game, you get hit twice with the explosion, you know, just in case, you know, just in case like you dodge it properly or whatever. In this, I've, I've noticed that it hits you thrice. So there, unless you like have other things drawing aggro where you're able to get just far enough out of the radius by running and dodging that you're okay. Um, it's real in the radius is I think larger too, so you have a it's really difficult, if not impossible, to dodge. So combining this with you know attack like difficult if not impossible to dodge attacks. I won't say impossible, nothing's impossible, but like nearly impossible to attack to dodge attacks. Uh, attacks that are constantly dealing you chip damage with 
no really, outside of stacking holy damage negation, there's really nothing done there. And um, an aggressive attack pattern that doesn't necessarily lead much options for healing here, along with like a gi giant AOE explosions that are done. It, you're in for a rough time. Also, by the way, uh, if you get grabbed twice, you instantly die. You instantly, instantly lose the encounter. So, final boss fight, I think. The fact that I had to change my entire build and no amount of time I spent trying to figure it out. I was I spent probably eight hours. I, I spent probably a solid on stream seven to eight hours trying to do it the normal way, and then I spent about two hours doing it like the done way, and I did it. And um, it doesn't feel good. I think that's like kind of the low point of the DLC, the final boss. Now it's boss to the walls, slap you down hard. God knows I knew that I used like the Remembrance Reharvesters afterwards to get all three of there are are in fact three things that drop from the from Primer Dawn and Michael's Remembrance. I made sure to get them all in one go, so I never have to do that that fight again. I mean I could go and do that fight again. I mean now that I know like what I have to do, it's not that big of a deal. It's just I don't I, I like sticking with like the same kind of like build strategy when I'm doing it and I don't necessarily um, I digress. Um, I think ultimately, the my time with Shadow of the Earth Tree has been great. There's still more things I have to explore. I still have to collect all the items. I still have to upgrade all of the items. A lot of work to be done. Uh, thankfully, they are very, very generous with both somber and just somber and regular uh, ancient dragon smithing stones. So you know, at the very least, on subsequent playthroughs of going through the Shadowlands. Um, the amount of, uh, you know, the amount of, um, what they call the uh, smithing stones and grave warts are going to be more easily obtained. Uh, some of the new ashes, war, ashes of war are amazing. Some of the new spirit ashes are really, really cool. Definitely worth giving a shot. And um, I do think that ultimately y'all are going to be, are have a great time with this DLC if you haven't already. I loved it. I, uh, want to spend even more time in the Shadowlands, and I will be um, for the foreseeable future, but I think at, at present we will be going back to our regularly scheduled programming. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so very much for listening. I appreciate you, your time, and your listenership at time of recording. There will probably be a Skyrim New Game Plus run. I've got it with some mod. I was able to start to make a New Game Plus run in Skyrim, so... I'm looking forward to seeing that tonight, that at time of recording or at, uh, at time of posting. It'll be at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so I'd love to see all that. Otherwise, you can check out when I'm live at himedia.gg slash live. Our schedule is there. Anywho, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so very much for listening. Thank you so very much for watching. Please support us at himedia.gg slash tip. $1 a month is a boon to my mental health and gives you benefits and access uh, in our Discord to exclusive access videos, early access videos, and more. Please, I am very... Thank you so very much for listening to this Elder Break review. I appreciate y'all, your time, and your listenership. Have a wonderful day.